Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the briefing room. My name is Eric Kavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's event in which we're going to talk about some of the more interesting stuff happening out there in the world of information management. The exact title is An App Platform for the Real-Time Enterprise, the briefing room with Dr. Robin Bloor and Enterprise Web. Folks, this is one of the tools out there, or one of the platforms, I should say, that uh, in my humble opinion is taking a rather brave uh, look at how information management should be done. There is a whole variety of activity happening out there in the world of enterprise technology, and it seems to me some of the more innovative companies are some of the smaller ones right now, and they're taking a very open-minded, very different perspective on how to manage data and deliver insights. So there is a slide about yours truly and enough about me. As many of you know, the whole mission of the briefing room here is to reveal the essential characteristics of enterprise software. That's why we take analysts and we put them in a virtual room with enterprise vendors and we take briefings. So we do not have the analyst and the vendor coordinate before the show. That is a critical success factor, frankly, for the briefing room because we do not want these to sound just like fully scripted infomercials. Frankly, uh, a lot of the reason behind our design is to keep yours truly entertained, so I guess you could say the format is a little bit selfish in that regard, but it also it, it happens to wind up creating some very good, interesting content for you as well. I will say the best way to get custom value from these presentations is to ask questions, so please don't be shy. Let us know what's on your mind, and we will pose those questions at the end of the webcast. So we cover a different topic every month. April is intelligence. So we're talking about traditional business intelligence, but also some of these new approaches that are being taken to deliver intelligence to the right people at the right time. And you'll hear a very interesting perspective on how that can be done from our presenters today. So Robin Bloor, my partner, and the, uh, the namesake, the eponymous analyst here at the Bloor Group, has a really interesting way of breaking down what intelligence is. There's hindsight, insight, oversight, and foresight. So of course, foresight is looking forward. Oversight is what's happening now. Typically, hindsight and insight are looking backwards. Of course, hindsight, by definition, is looking backwards. But what we're finding is there are more and more organizations embracing more of a real-time view of analytics. And how do you do that? Well, you do it in some different ways than have been traditionally done. So if you think about the range of innovations occurring right now, things like NoSQL technology, things enabling various kinds of situational awareness, you can find out what's going on immediately all over the place. Just think about, as a quick analogy, something like Twitter or Facebook or even LinkedIn. These tools have tremendous engines underneath them that can handle outrageous amounts of real-time data. Now, a lot of what's happening is the traditional ACID type issues with, with respect to relational databases are being relaxed. You get something like uh, eventual consistency is what some of them talk about. There are other ways of doing it, but the point is that if you think of the whole mindset around service orientation, the SOA or service-oriented architecture, even though we don't talk so much about SOA today, I would argue that the legacy, pun intended, of SOA is service enablement and looking at different different ways of creating very light applications that are pulled together really just in time is the idea. So just in time composite apps is the kind of thing we'll be talking about today. And there are some really positive benefits to taking this approach. Number one, if you think about the amount of time and effort and work it takes to build a data warehouse, well, by the time you unload some new source of information to your warehouse, it may be too late to take advantage of various opportunities. So if you do this sort of late binding kind of thing, which we're going to find out today from our presenter, you can benefit from a lot of this sort of real-time awareness and insight. So our analyst today is, as I mentioned, going to be Dr. Bloor. We'll hear from him after the presentation. So Enterprise Web, formerly ID8, is an, an intelligent operations platform. So you can see some highlights, business process management, business activity monitoring, data migration and quality, master data management, but sort of weaving all these things together. And we'll also hear about this App Store concept. Of course, uh, Apple really revolutionized the whole idea of applications with the App Store, and we've seen more than a few vendors pick up on that concept. So we'll talk about that today. So Dave Dougal is co-founder and managing director of Enterprise Web. He's a very smart guy and has a lot of uh, experience out there in the industry. So he knows where he's coming from. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand the keys to the WebEx over to you. 
Dave. And uh, if you want to do your screen share or however you want to do it, let us know what you got. Great. Are you now seeing my screen? Not yet. Go top left, go to quick start. And sh if you go to the top left of your screen, hit on that, that quick start button right there. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. There we go. Now it's starting. There we go. All right, go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you for setting aside the time for today's presentation, and thank you for the intro, Eric. That was great. Um, and I think that, you know, I can summarize what I'm going to be reviewing today, uh, just going to Robin's distillation of, you know, foresight and insight. And what that really depends on is access to, you know, data, access to state information in real time. And a lot of the problems that we have today, of course, across the enterprise, is that we don't have generalized access to state information uh, in real time. And our state data is trapped all over in silos, stacks, you know, et cetera, stovepipes uh, across the organization. And uh, really, if we want to move into a 21st century way of thinking where we can uh, personalize every interaction, where we can have cross-process interoperability and governance, uh, when we can adapt uh, for variants uh, at the individual level as well as adapt models um, for uh, you know, future use on the fly. Uh, we need to change our thinking. And again, as Eric pointed out, I think that's, you know, it, it's really dependent on real-time thinking, right? Because if we're talking about context and if we're talking about insight, well, insight and context are, are sort of perishable notions, right? We need to actually understand things in their current context the context from last month isn't as interesting as the context from the last moment. So we, we want to actually bind things at the very end. So when we look at today's application model, uh, it's really, you know, it was really intended for a time. You know, we will develop uh, an application or process in isolation. We will test it in isolation. We will then publish it. Of course, when we publish it, because of all the dependencies of the environment, some things might break. Uh, we'll get some feedback from the business users. That'll go into some sort of queue, and we will then go offline again in a discontinuous fashion, uh, update those in isolation, and then repeat that cycle. And it's interesting, but that, that model really is a model that it almost goes back to the physical world, right? We're talking about a model that's maybe suited for building furniture when I want to design something and I want it to have static properties and then I want to put it out into the world. Uh, that's fine, but when we're talking about the digital age and sharing data and information in real time and being more operationally responsive, um, you know, we don't have to have this discontinuous divide. We can actually just live in the real time. A computer has no knowledge of design time and run time. That's a, an abstraction that the computer has no knowledge of. So we really need to just live in the real time and be able to share state information uh, universally. Uh, again, a big deal, a big reason that this is a problem is because of the way we've organized ourselves. Um, we tend to take sort of a near-term, short-sighted focus on tactical applications. And the problem with that is we code these si process silos and application stovepipes is that we're trapping state in them, right? So we have all this valuable information that's being trapped. And maybe at one point we thought that application wasn't going to have much utility, um, so it didn't make sense to actually code it in a way that would be broadly useful. But down the line, actually, uh, we might want that information. And now we've sort of, by design, precluded the ability to share that information. We've also inhib uh, inhibited the scalability of this system because now we're, we're, when we're trapping state all over the place, we need to now deal with latencies that are going to come um, and complexity that's going to come from writing joins, complex joins, et cetera, to extract that information. And what it does is it, it creates a barrier from doing interesting things in your applications. And so while I understand that not everything is strategic in nature, um, and if we could say that it's an 80-20, 80% tactical, 20% strategic, I'd say it still follows the, the Pareto principle, where those 20% things that are strategic um, are going to be 80% of your time, and that's why we struggle in the enterprise. And if we now take this and project that into the current era, and Eric was talking about service orientation, and now we look at this world of distributed APIs, um, services, devices, right? The old three-tier architecture is gone. 
We don't, we don't code to a database anymore and to a singular device. In fact, we code to mo uh, multiple uh, sources and multiple targets. And at the rate that things are changing, uh, we don't know what those targets might be two months from now, right? We, don't, we might have new sources and new targets. So we have, to be, we have to be developing in a much more flexible, adaptable way to survive in this environment. And you can see some of the challenges. I think anybody who's worked in service orientation, who's worked in complex distributed systems before, you know, understands that we've gained something with distributed computing, but we've also lost some things. And what we lost is some unifying principles. So the challenges that we have in service orientation are things like version control. How do I enforce version control across all of my services and APIs? How do I enforce governance, security? Anal how do I do cross-cutting analytics in a service-oriented world? These things are all now very problematic. Um, at, at some point in the mainframe, they were actually easier. And so we, there was a trade-off made, but we shouldn't forget that we've lost some things. We, we really need to get them back if we want to get sort of the transformational value of, uh, of this, uh, this era. So, you know, essentially we've been, all this time, we've been compounding the object relational mismatch. If many of you will recognize the mismatch that comes from uh, relational databases and uh, on the database management side and objects on the, on the application development side. And the problem is, uh, you know, the developers want things coded to their applications and they want more richness than maybe uh, a columnar and row database, database might give them. So they encode that richness in an object. But unfortunately, when they do that, they're wrapping that data and encapsulating it behind methods, which makes that data uh, untouchable, unreachable by other applications and other systems. And that's actually, if we go back a second, that actually got worse with service orientation. Because with service orientation, we took those very same objects that were already encapsulated by methods, and we just then threw them behind a service interface. So we've effectively put them behind two schemas. We've, we've double encapsulated. A, a, a service that contains objects is a black box with black boxes inside. And it just makes, very, it makes things difficult to introspect. Uh, it makes different thing, uh, things difficult to personalize and adapt. So we need to move forward. And so what, what we're saying is that we need a new way of, a new application model for uh, this new world we lived in, live in. And, and this new world is characterized by, you know, being a network, right? And I think if you talk to Sergey Brin, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, Mark Zuckerberg, who happened to go to my high school, actually, interestingly enough, um, you'd find out they would certainly acknowledge that it's a networked world, right? We're networks of people, we're networks of devices, we're networks of, of rules and functions. In fact, I'd argue if we stripped away all the technology, that's what we inherently are. Human organizations are network, networks of people, capabilities, and resources. And when we, when we did the automation uh, technology of the 20th century, we actually started hard coding things in a way that sort of we've lost that network flexibility, with that sort of natural flexibility that comes with human systems. So we got to get back there. So uh, I know that you guys, you know, one of the things I like being about uh, being in the briefing room, it's uh, sort of like the sports, uh, you know, the sports center for, you know, data management geeks. So, you know, we can, we can go, we can drill into the details here. So, um, so I'm going to drill into some of the details for those people, you know, uh, in the audience that, you know, would appreciate, you know, what we've really done uh, at a technical level. You know, you don't need to understand it technically to use it. So we separate model, the logical model, from physical storage, right? So historically, you know, you had a database. It had a specific structure, and applications had to deal with it. And then, of course, applications, you know, didn't like dealing with that structure so that they came up with other workarounds for doing that. And uh, what we're saying is, you know what, actually, we really need generically structured databases so that we can then project whatever the applications want and now the database is stored physically in one way, and the domain or logical model is whatever it needs to be, and, and any number of applications can be, uh, share this information space. So our space is uh, characterized by loose coupling, late, late binding, uh, semantic enterprise application integration. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the old EAI, but we're doing semantic enterprise application. We're in real time, we're binding uh, people, code, and data, and rules uh, on the fly 
to deliver a personalized response every time for every user, for every click in the system. So that means like we're doing things like interpreting models at runtime. We're constructing their ontologies against rules. Uh, so we compare those models against their uh, any rules and we evaluate them and then we uh, project schemas uh, and we derive the payload or UI. And we do all of that in a way that's completely safe. It's actually uh, ACID, supports ACID uh, semantics, and uh, provides for audit history and rollback. And I'd argue that while some people would say that, you know, you can't use a dynamic system in the enterprise, we'll, we'll lose some control, I'd say, well, what have you already surrendered in the systems that we have? Uh, what has the uh, build deploy cycle cost us? What does it continually cost us? What, what can't we do because of the current models we have? So if you allow, and I'll demonstrate today, some of the capabilities that we have uh, will make you feel very comfortable that you can actually have your cake and eat it too. Uh, so as a result of separating logical model from physical model, we can support local variance and global change. Uh, so this is very important. Remember, this is about the real-time enterprise. We're talking about the convergence of, well, actually the reunification of the application space and the data space, right? They were together one time in the mainframe. Then Humpty Dumpty fell off the wall, and it all broke apart, and we haven't been able to put it together again since then. Um, but they were all together at one point. So we're not talking about something radically new. In fact, we're talking about restoring some of the old uh, first principles uh, of days of yore and bringing them back uh, in a powerful way in our new distributed, diverse, and dynamic world that we live in today. So we start there with generic storage, where everything is in a singular registry or repository. All of your data and code, whether it's local and federated, structured and unstructured, your entities and your reference data, your catalog data, your price data, your, your logs, everything is stored in one facility, right? And that could, you know, because we're talking about federated data as well, that could just be resources representing uh, third-party sy uh, systems, databases, APIs, uh, and services. So it's just the idea that everything is known in this space, and it's all indexed in this space, and it makes it all searchable and available semantically to the system. So uh, a, a unified, in, a virtually unified environment. So if you read the abstract to this presentation, you know people are struggling with all different kinds of uh, techniques right now, from master data management, virtualization, data services, et cetera. But they're still not getting things unified. And what we're really doing here is we're, we're effectively offering a service-oriented information system that can live above the layer of your existing legacy systems and your existing libraries of services and your existing libraries of APIs and add value to them in a unified way. So what does this look like? Well, we, we remember we start with this premise that the organization is a network fundamentally. It's a network connected by links and connected by metadata and change history. So when we take links, metadata, and change history, and we put that in one space, we're essentially creating a three, you know, think of it as a living cube, right? You know, normally you actually code a cube, and a cube gives you the perspectives at the time the cube was designed, and it might be more flexible than your data warehouse, but not much more so. And it has its own inherent constraints. Here we're talking about an operational living cube that's taking all of your data in an unstructured way and allowing it to be project, projected flexibly for any application in real time, all of the time. So that means uh, real-time predictive analytics being injected into real-time processes, uh, real-time business intelligence, right? So uh, I know that the, the theme of April is uh, you know intelligence analytics, and what we're really doing is pushing the frontier of operational uh, intelligence. So what we do is we have system agents that mash up all of that information, right? So they live over this space because this would be a com very complex, unstructured space. But let's face it, your enterprise is a complex uh, space. And uh, so what we have is these distributable software agents that mash up all of that information. And effectively, every time you click in our system, you're calling the software agent that grabs the model for whatever you, know, for whatever you requested in the system. It interprets that model against the metadata and the links evaluates it against rules, it creates a runtime container, uh, which effectively it's building aggregates, you could think of it that way. It's building its own aggregates, its own local interaction-specific cache, 
and it's delivering a customized uh, response faster than any in-memory database that exists. With, and if you really think of it, an in-memory solution is really a brute force solution uh, on top of your existing legacy status quo. It's like saying, okay, gosh, we really have a complex join environment. It's almost too complex for us to manage. Let's just put this in memory in there, even though it's not persisted, and we have some caching issues related to this. You know, we'll create this this sort of phantom space. Here we're saying, no, this is fully persisted, and it's fully real time, millisecond speed, and you're going to see that. So what we get as a result is from any source to any target for any workload, right? Because we're going to have diverse and distributed sources and diverse and distributed targets, and we're going to have uh, you know diversity in the workload, right? So all we're saying is we're going to let those algorithms be flexibly configured at runtime. We're going to derive the service interface. Instead of coding the service interface, for those of you who are service-oriented, uh, you know, you, you'll be very familiar with the term coarse-grained and fine-grained, right? Coarse-grained means a service interface is generic. It's made to be widely reusable. But, of course, anything that's generic isn't particularly appealing to the business because they want things specific. So now it's not that, so generic things don't get high reuse statistically. Then if you, it's, of course, if it's fine grained, then it's specialized. And if it's specialized, by definition, it's going to get low reuse because it was made for a purpose. So the problem we have in service orientation today is our, our service interfaces suffer for premature optimization. We define them in advance and then we set them out into the wild and then we forget that the wild is wild and that we want those, we want those interfaces to be uh, dynamically configured. We want things to be able to be adapt with their context. And this can all be controlled by rules to create very structured apps that can be more or less dynamic. But if you don't support that latent capacity for adaptation, for flexibility, for personalization, then you just simply won't have it. Um, so this is what real-time semantic enterprise application integration is about. There's your sort of conventional... Uh, SOA, you know, uh, c concept or component diagram, except that we're doing all this really in one layer. So that's very much a conceptual diagram in our system. In our system, there truly is only a singular layer. It's all just stuff living in a repository. The models are data in the repository. The rules are data in the repository. Services APIs are data in a repository. Everything lives in a repository, and the agent puts it together. And the agent is actually... Um, so I'm going to actually skip into the demo there. The agent is doing all of your uh, connections, your transformations, your orchestrations, uh, all at runtime. So that all a business analyst needs to do is model applications using links and metadata. You don't have to worry at all about implementation details, which are, are getting out of hand, right? Implementation details are what are slowing down development productivity. They're what's making things difficult. So our software agents do that and they do that very efficiently. So I'm just going to pop open my browser now. How am I doing for time, Eric? You're okay. Go ahead. we got about at least five more minutes. Thanks. Okay. If I could squeak out 10, I'll take it, but, you know, I'll let you give me the hook whenever. So uh, go to, you know, there's plenty of information on our website. You can go to that for uh, more detail about our company. But I'm just going to go uh, log into this environment. So I'm logging into the system, and every click from that moment I'm logging in is clicking into effectively an unstructured database, right? This UI doesn't exist. It's being derived. It's uh, the, U, uh, the components. It's you know finding com UI components in the database. It's looking at my security. It's looking at where I live in the organization. It's looking at all of my permissions. It's looking at what I'm trying to do, and it composes everything for me dynamically. So let's start on sort of operational intelligence. One thing we start off with, we think is very powerful, is enterprise-wide search. And when we say enterprise-wide search, it's truly enterprise-wide. It's of everything, and it's all filtered based on your permission. So if I'm a database administrator, uh, I might be able to find all the ERDs, all the data models, all the entities. If I'm a developer, I might be able to find all the rules, uh, all the services, all of the APIs, uh, all of the functions in the system. If I'm a business user, I do this, and I actually find records. So the system goes out that fast. And it actually builds this collection. None of this is hard-coded. These views are being composed dynamically. So you can see that when I searched cancer, it found cancer across several collections. And it actually automatically normalized filters based on what it can normalize across those collections. Now, let's say I want to go into proposals, 
I noticed, noticed that the filters dynamically changed because now that I've drilled into a singular collection, I can actually add some more filters there dynamically. Let's say I just want to see active records. And now actually I just want to see records that are between this and this. Now I'm down to one record. I can actually flip over my records. We want everybody to feel like, you know, we're really talking about things as objects, right? When we talk about a networked application model, everything really is a node. And we want to make people understand that they're actually touching things that are quasi-physical, that they can uh, touch them and interact with them based on their rules. And they could look at and introspect these objects, whether they're a human or a system. And we can even do interesting things like graph analysis on the fly. So now I've instantly, from my portal, found a record. I can actually look at that record quickly. I can say, you know what, actually, I'm interested in this one gentleman. I see I'm just analyzing on the fly as a business user graph relations, and I just want to click in. So this is all the graph relationships to that one record. You can see there were people and other records associated with it. And I click into Vamshi, and now I'm actually seeing the world as it relates to Vamshi Vadi Raja. And I can actually see, huh, that's interesting. I can see he's associated to Archita. He's associated to some other records there. He's associated to Bill. If I go in here and I click, now it actually takes me in from that graph view into a record. And now I'm into a full-blown record. This record is an object itself, and this object has a full history of every single person who's ever touched this record. We know every single, that's, every single thing that's ever been done to it. So we follow the principle of immutability. If you remember one of those, uh, those PowerPoint diagrams, they showed that we have all of the history of every record. And it's not just every record, it's of everything, right? Of every API, of every service, of every node, of every application, of every person, we, we, sort, uh, we save the delta of everything, all of the diffs. And actually, we build up these views of aggregates uh, from, from those, uh, you know, so it's called event sourcing in, in, in the database world, right? So it has a, a, a much broader perspective in our system because we apply it universally. So all of these kind of notions in the database world are just applying more powerfully in our system. Same thing would be with version control, because everything is universally applied. Security is universally applied, right? So we have this notion if, if people on the, you know, I've been speaking a lot to the data side, but if you're on the application side and you're an old sort of CS type person, you'll understand notions of, you know, cross-cutting concerns. And how do, you, how do you mix issues like version control across all of your objects and all of your domains? And that's one of the things we're addressing in the system. So full lifecycle history, I could see that the objects that are related to this, so that there are people objects and other uh, record objects related to it, and I can click in, I could drill through these objects. If I look into Bill's mailbox, I can actually open up another object right here on the fly. And we have some really nice features, and, I, and I'm just, in the time that's allowed, I'm only just meandering through to give you a sense of our database, uh, our, well, our application uh, platform. Um, but I can click in here, we have field level commenting, we have line item change management. We have the whole history of all commenting preserved for all records for all time, right? And of course, we could clip that at any time. We could set up rules. We could hide that from certain individuals if we needed to. I'm gonna log out very quickly, log in. And you can even see that process is uncharacteristically quick in our system, even though it's fully dynamic. So I'm gonna log in as Archita, another one of our members in, in our, our company. And so Archita has a whole host of different records as well. She's got a bio, her profile is here, and we can go through that if we want to. She has some different records in her inbox, and all of our inboxes connect with email, et cetera. And one of the nice controls that we have, since it's a fully dynamic system, and we have no, we have no divide, we don't have the discontinuity between design time and runtime, everything is real time, I can actually not only chatter about objects in the system, I could change objects in the system if I have the rights, right? This is in-flight change management, right? The whole notion of social, you know, as this add-on, sort of kludged on add-on, it's not really taking off particularly well, right? It's got some limited success for where organizations have a discipline. And the reason social is not taking off is because it's not fully integrated. When we really want to be social in our enterprise, we're going to actually so we're going to be actually discussing and negotiating our objects together in real time, just like if we were talking face-to-face. -face. So Archita has some rights. She can change this label to Archita's label. 
And you can see the change will appear in the form immediately, but will be subject to review. So all of this is subject to whatever rules and processes that you might want. See what I mean. So I'm just going to save that. She's going to make another change in here really quickly. And I notice that, uh, let's say I go in here, and I notice that one of my values is not Robin Bloor. So I want the, you know, uh, Robin Bloor to be a value. You know, how often does that happen when you go to a table and a value is not found? Now, of course, you don't want to denormalize all of your tables, but you also want some liquidity in your environment for when those times when you do need to support that change. So our cheat has actually just requested two new things. Let's log in as Bill, who is our developer. Bill is just, in this world, Bill is actually just another user of the same runtime, real-time system. So Bill goes in, and you're going to notice in the upper right corner, do you see that there's in the mailbox there, there's a nice number two there. His mail icon is now blue because he has two new icons. There's a field change request, a data model change request. Let's check that out. Uh, and he can see that uh, value to be added, strategic plan alignment. There's a new label for this table. It's giving him the context of it. And now I can actually decide to apply that just to that instance. Apply, you know, I want Robin Bloor in, in that table forever. For all. And the very fact that I did this, that I changed that table, that's also just been version control. The fact that Bill did it is now in the logs. The fact that our cheetah requested it, that's all in the logs. Right, so everything is, has a trace, and it's all, it can all be rolled back. Now the mailbox is down to one. Let's go back in. And if I, time allows, I actually have an example of predictive analytics that I think would really impress your, your audience. But you can see here that the context of the change being requested is always presented. This is what the original version was, and you can see that it's actually a working field, right? Because there's no boundary between simulation and real time in our system. Everything, all the controls just work all of the time. It's a fully dynamic environment. So, you know, Bill could look at this and say, no, Archita, we're not, well, I'm not going to charge that, I'm not going to change that globally or even for your instance. I'm just rejecting that. And now what, what I've actually had, or what's actually gone on here, and again, you could do this through whatever layers. You know, Bill might be on a help desk. Bill might be a person who owns a table. Bill might be, you know, it doesn't have to be direct to the developers. You could push this through whatever processes and controls that you wanted, but the fact is what we've allowed here, what we've enabled, is a real-time dialogue about the things that we care about and the things that we're working on. And now we don't have to worry about shadow systems anymore. And now we don't have to worry about uh, lost business value anymore, right? Because those are all the things that, you know, we could deny them, but of course that's really what's happening. After 20, 30 years of system management, uh, you know, of autom system automation in the enterprise, the least automated, least efficient part of the enterprise by far is change management. Ask any business user. You know, I mean, and let's, let's be honest, what percentage of real problems are, are they even bothering to report? Because they know the likelihood is going to be low of them getting fixed. So there's one in-flight change has been denied. And our chief can look at that and she says, oh, bummer, that was denied. And, of course, she could go back and forth with Bill if she wanted to. Um, but, hey, that's what we would do in the real world, right? We would negotiate our content, right? That's, that's what happens. I don't know about you guys, but that's what happens in my household. It certainly happens amongst the members of our team. Uh, we negotiate our relationship with each other continuously. And our software is no longer a hindrance uh, with that so I've got one more thing that I'd really like to show here. Is that okay? Yeah, go ahead. I appreciate your indulgence. <laughs> it's interesting stuff. It's uh, I like the new um, just-in-time UI. Thank you. Well, you know, the old UI was all real-time. I think that it just didn't reflect how dynamic things actually were. And I don't know if you've noticed, we've put in all of these fades because people wouldn't see how fast the system was if we didn't, they wouldn't even know their pages were changing because we're, we're cha updating these pages. So uh, we found that users got disoriented. They wouldn't know when something was changing. So we actually put that as, as, a, as a little human signal uh, to, to individuals. So let's say, let's pretend Bill is working, you know, because we still, you know, we can have every, we do, you know, we, we're doing multi-million dollar enterprise-wide projects on four continents. 
Um, we're working for huge billion dollar organizations with tens of thousands of uh, people in their people tables, thousands of active, active users every day, hundreds of thousands of records tend, heading towards millions of records. Uh, complex implementations, doing addressing problems that no combination of app dev, business process management are doing for them. Right? These are sole source bids we're winning because they just can't solve it for any other way. So let's let you know. So even though we can do everything, obviously in a live environment, and we can do because if you're working, you know, we're working essentially in a stateless sort of restful environment. So we can, you know. You know, it's like updating a file system. I could just drop a new document in here, drop new nodes in here. It doesn't disrupt anybody. The next time you hit that node, you'll get the latest version of it. And I can even put rules around that. I can make nodes apply retroactively. So it's a very, you know, um, uh, resilient, anti-fragile environment. But, let's, uh, but we can obviously still respect paradigms like test dev prod. That's just a good practice. So let's pretend Bill is working in a, in a development environment. And he's building an environment for himself and he can actually configure the application as he's doing it. He just gets one extra tab on his uh, little portal there, on his window into this application. And he's actually looking at his application at the same time he's designing it. He's literally designing it in front of himself. And you can see that there's a predictive analytic in this. It's actually making a recommendation to him. Now, if I click in here, it's actually telling me about the probability. And not only on that, since Bill's a developer, Bill can actually see that object. So Bill's actually now going into another view to actually you know, look at that particular object. And Bill can actually see what is literally the world's simplest predictive analytics. You can see there's a very tight uh, JavaScript syntax there. Now, predictive analytics is something that people are talking about doing with information scientists. Yeah, right, right? I mean, I mean anybody who's worked in enterprise uh, development before realized that you know, when you're doing your real world projects, you're not probably gonna have access to a lot of information scientists. So we need to make difficult things much more accessible. So we have a very tight JavaScript syntax that, gosh, you know, I'm not even particularly technical, and I understand that, right? I mean, it's almost in English. And I even have a waiting, and I could, uh, you, know, you know, make this as much as complex as I'd like. But that, that is actually, I just need to shovel over. How do I do that? Thank you. Uh, so I just actually got a view into that object. So let's say Bill wants to see something and he wants to change a value in here. Let's actually see that predictive analytic take effect. I'm going to actually change my se selection there. I changed one of the metadata, pieces of the metadata that affects that predictive analytic. And now you're going to see that the information is updated in real time and that the weighting has all been updated in real time. And you notice that this weighting is not just from application level data. It's checking personal profile information, application keywords. It's going to look in the funder entity. So this could be a pretty interesting, uh, you know, analytic, and it's all happening in real time. Now, now let's actually do the coup de gras here. I want to show you something about durability, and then I'll stop. And there's much more I could do. Let's break this on purpose. Now, this is not something I think I've ever seen another vendor do, but I'm going to do it for you. I'm going to break something because, you know what, it doesn't really matter what you build an application for. Anybody can break the semantic relationship with an application, right? It doesn't matter whether it's Java, .NET, or anything like that. So I purposely broke something. You know, now the system gave a lot of guidance. It helps me in a lot of different ways, but I broke that on purpose. Let's go back out here. Let's close this. Let's go back into my application, and let's see. Did I disrupt anything? Can I still get into the app? Oh, no, no problem getting into the app. Can I get to the page? Yeah, no problem getting into the page. Hey, look at that. Its page is still running. It just can't run that one service. Now, compare that to the service-oriented world, where if I change, if I make a non-material change to a service interface, I break instantaneously every app that calls it. And the only solution to that is, is what's called ceremony, which means development discipline, which means it's likely not a sustainable practice. It's not automated. Here, the, so anytime you change something in the service-based world, you have a very fragile environment. Here you have a very durable environment. My system didn't break. My instance of my application didn't break. My page didn't break. I could still move around. And look at this. I get a manifest of what the agent did. So this is a real-time manifest. Now, most people couldn't run a single SQL statement in the time that we fetched 50 or so resources, fetched, transformed, right, introspected, interpreted, mashed up, right, 
That's, that, this is real-time semantic application integration. And look at this. The system actually tells me where the error lies, and it takes me to the page where it believes the error lives. And, you know, with relatively quick analysis here, yeah, that's probably the problem. And I can go. I can uh, move this out of my way. Your little uh, slider thing is getting in my way here. It doesn't really matter, I guess. So now I'm going to go back. And I think I hit save. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to go back to my messages. I'm going to go back in as Bill. Let's go back in. Look at that. Systems restored. Hmm. That's good stuff. Um, yep, go ahead. Yeah, let me go ahead and hand it over to uh, to Robin so we can get into some Q&A here in just a second. But that is very interesting. I love seeing uh, I love seeing a vendor actively break the solution during a live webcast. You just you can't beat that, folks. <laughs> so let me go ahead and I'm going to dig up Robin's slides and then hand the deck over to him. There is his first slide. With that, Robin, I'm guessing that uh, you found that a rather interesting presentation as well. And with that, the yeah, that is. It was an interesting presentation. A little bewildering, I have to say. Um, okay. Um, normally, uh, when I do the briefing room, I normally put together an architecture diagram in some way that describes the space of the um, area that I'm talking about. I didn't do that this week. And the reason I didn't do it is I wouldn't know how to draw an architecture diagram that was capable of integrating everything that Enterprise Web claims to be capable of integrating. So. Really, and I'm not really going to say much, actually. Um, I'm just going to discuss the nature of the problem. Yeah, again, I mean, Dave went through it. I'll go through it in my way. But um, then I'll start asking questions because this is a really unusual. I mean, in my experience, it's an incredibly unusual technology. Anyway, let's let's begin by the fact that we have an incoherence problem. The incoherence problem is right across the enterprise at various layers of technology. Um, software evolution uh, at various points in time, and I've been around for a fairly long time, um, I suspect a little bit longer than Dave, and um, I've watched architectures come and go with various um, claims about the coherence they give to the environment and the capability they would confer, and as you can kind of see from this, we have become more and more distributed. We went out from centralized architectures to client server architectures to multi tier architectures to web based architectures, and then we went to SOA and I added the information oriented architecture. SOA was very interesting. I even wrote a book about it, the um, <coughs> SOA for Dummies. And I remember when writing that book that there was actually absolutely no data layer for SOA. There actually was no interface layer, and there was no service management layer, so SOA was actually an incomplete model from the get-go. Um, when we did the research uh, a couple of years ago for information-oriented architecture, what I was really doing was just uh, building a, a data layer that kind of conformed to SOA. Now, I could have thrown those, both of those kind of architectures up as diagrams to this presentation, but I don't think there's any point because they, can, they contain things that it appears that Enterprise Web doesn't use and doesn't need. Um, but we'll discover when we start talking about it. Um, various platforms emerged. Okay, we had 4G on database, and we had relational database, and we had object orientation. Then we went to web services, and BPM came screaming out of one side of that, and so it came screaming out of the other. And, and they were all partial solutions. They really weren't complete solutions at all. Um, they were good in that they improved on what had gone before. There were things that they fixed that the previous thing didn't fix. Um, and sometimes they actually uh, failed to do things that previous things had done. It, all the platforms that I've ever come across, they're actually partial platforms. And they may be very good in their area, let's say, of focus, but they're partial. Um, and while all of this evolution was going on in terms of architecture, in terms of various approaches to software and technology, everything became more complex. You know, hardware, we went to desktops and laptops and <laughs> internet and then mobile, um, and we added you know, multi-core capability and memory capability. And we're going to embedded chips. You know, the hardware world that we look at is 
in terms of the number of entities in it is so, so different to the mainframe that it's almost bewildering if you actually try and remember back to the mainframe days. And in terms of environments, we have Unix, Windows, Linux, virtual machines, we've got grids, we've got the cloud. The deployment environment has become much more complex than it ever was. Uh, in terms of data files, relational um, databases, unstructured data, Hadoop, machine data, and all of this in many different incarnations, in many different products, all of which are slightly different to each other in one way or another in terms of applications. We had transactional applications, then we had desktop applications for the office systems, the BI, um, web applications, big data, and we're now moving to semantic data um, or semantic oriented applications. And that's just become a much wider and broader field than ever happened before. And then we've got the management layer that's supposed to make all of this stuff work, which is service management, asset management, cost management, threat management, data security. Uh, um, the whole of governance, actually, you could probably replace that with the word governance, to be honest. Um, but you've got the whole of governance, and what you're trying to govern is an incredibly diverse application environment, an incredibly, incredibly diverse data environment, incredibly diverse operational environments, and incredibly diverse hardware. And so it's like the situation has just been getting worse and worse and worse at the same time that we've been failing to solve the architectural problem of deploying, you know, what was deployable at the time that that stuff came into existence, you know, when relational came in and when object orientation came in and so on. Um, and this takes me to um, the incoherence problem. You know, we operate in silos um, or we operate in clusters of silos. We've got an architecture like SOA that actually happens to do some things for us. Then all we've done is cluster some silos together, and that itself is some kind of silo. Um, we have a long tail of legacy, and it's not going away. You know, every now and then, you know, the odd thing disappears, but mostly it hangs around. We've got new technologies, new environments, new applications. All of those things continue to emerge, and including things that we haven't really thought of yet. You know, there's going to be there's going to be new applications in the next decade if the last four um, four decades or anything to go by that we didn't ever anticipate. And we lack coherence at every level. And ultimately, I see this as an architecture problem, and I see it as a formidable one. So it seems to me that Enterprise Web is claiming that it actually solves a great deal of this, if not all of it. So, Dave, and to be honest, Dave, I'm going to jump off in about five minutes because I think the audience ought to be given a go. So I hope you don't. I'm not going to ask all of these questions. But I would like to, I'd like to ask the first question, which is, okay, it appears from what you've demonstrated and from the presentation you've given that there's a, a great deal of capability in enterprise web. So the real question is, what kind of applications can it not do? What, what would you never point it at? Well, I mean, interesting. When we were talking to somebody today um, who is uh, very close to uh, some uh, large government and telecommunications projects that wants to use it for signal-to-noise uh, problems. So it, I, I think you have to step back. I mean, I, I don't want to it, – it does some very parochial things, uh, and it does can do some, you know, very uh, inspirational strategic things. Uh, but I think you have to look at back and to answer that, you have to look at what it is, right? It is it is actually uh, an extensible algorithm, right, that processes nodes in an undirected graph, right, which means that it's extensible in all directions, right? It doesn't care. It's generic on the storage side. It doesn't care about the media type of the storage. Um, we just need to know the semantic of everything that we're going to address, but it can address anything. It's not like an XML database just limited to XML. It's not, you know, it's it's a web style key value document database that uh, long skinny table that affects a generic storage, an undirected graph, right? And then what that does, it just means that we have just a, uh, all these nodes, and all of these nodes can be functions and data, right? So this takes us back to the world of declarative programming and functional programming and, and 20, 30-year-old ideas that we've just brought back within, in the context of web-style architecture. And uh, so all we're doing is saying, hey, we can actually contextualize functions at runtime. We don't need them to be methods to encapsulate data at, uh, in, uh, at design time. 
we can we can do pre, uh, we can do a prototypal inheritance across these nodes, and we can construct ontologies. So uh, yeah, I'm actually not going to shut the door on what we can do because we're talking to people about uh, you know we built an app the other day. Uh, we were given a requirement. Somebody came to me and said, can you build an ETL tool? And I said, please. I, I think I know why you're coming to me, but there's 20 or so open source ETL tools. Uh, every vendor has their own ETL tool. You know, there must be, you know, you'll, you'll have to tell me why you think you need us for us to do this for you. They said, well, they're all based on 20-year-old scripting technologies. Uh, they don't have, they're not uh, real-time adaptive. They don't have fully integrated human workflows and a, and a litany of other problems that they had with the existing ETL technologies. So this was a big SAP integrator. Uh, they gave us a real-world integration problem as described in a couple of emails and a couple of Excel files. And we gave them something back in a single day that they said was the best ETL tool in the market. Uh, you know, the, the system is actually doing real-world, very complex uh, GRC-type applications, governance, risk, and compliance applications, because it's actually really good. Because it's an unstructured environment, it can actually analyze, it can correlate information across multiple applications and processes running at the same time. Right? So we can detect things like conflict of interest. We can detect things like fraud. This is going to be huge for the financial industry and banks and insurers, right? Um, and it, cry, it requires no additional work, right? You just the, – the data is there. The records are there. If you have the rights to access those records, you can then run analytics across them based on those rights. Um, you know, we're doing, you know, what people, you know, Gartner calls intelligent business process management. Uh, Forrester calls maybe smart or dynamic business process management. Other people ad call adaptive case management. So uh, we're doing, you know, very flexible business processes for complex domains like the life sciences, R&D, uh, where you have long-running projects. They have big value chains that involve lots of different participants. They're in highly regulated environments where the rule environment is subject to continuous change. Uh, we're doing things that no other application has been able to do for these folks. So, I, you know, uh, I don't I, – well, I appreciate what your question is to, is to you know, define a space. Uh, what we've done is we've, we've, de we've developed a highly capable platform for composing and transforming and orchestrating nodes. Uh, and, you know, if that means calling a MapReduce algorithm, we'll call a MapReduce, uh, a MapReduce algorithm. If it means calling some other probabilistic algorithm to do something interesting, we could do that. That doesn't mean we've invented every one of those. What it means is that we've created a vehicle for bringing all those together under one roof. Because right now, everybody's just individually coding all of those problems, and they're just compounding their, uh, their application problems. So I'm sorry if I went a little bit long, but I wanted to answer that broadly. Okay. Well, the other question um, that I think is worth you addressing is it's, it's very nice to put um, a, a slide up that actually has um, a metadata layer, but managing metadata isn't a trivial thing. So um, how do you manage metadata, basically? So you know one you know one of the innovations here you know this is you know patent pending now we have multiple patents in the United States and uh, internationally is that we our software agents actually are curating the environment as they go right so the you know there's no secret how you make things smart you make things smart by actually having rich metadata of relationships and history right you you make things smart by having that through those three dimensions you make things smart by removing barriers to information sharing and interoperability how this, what the system is doing is in the course, you can think of the agent's execution as being a microflow within, within every interaction, within every, within every transaction, the agent is running a microflow, which includes evaluating the application logic, but it's also applying all concerns of the system, the database controls, it's applying uh, system governance controls, it's applying and the application logic all at the same time. And part of those system controls are it's tagging you know, it's machine indexing and tagging its universe as it goes. And as it does that, now you think about the power of that, it's creating new semantic pathways continuously. So every time uh, an individual process or application executes, it's just accrued to the semantic pathways of the entire enterprise, right? No, look, Ma, no hands, right? It's just doing it automatically. 
So, you know, again, we, we've got we've got sites that are deploying it in the field. Two years in the field, and we haven't had a single system crash. Um, so, you know, we're uh, you know bootstrap company, so we've been very low key, under the radar uh, by and large. Uh, just working with you know uh, market leading organizations that have you know uh, that want to be transformative but are you know running into problems and are are looking for new solutions. So uh, so this the system you know uh, you know the, so the best way to say that is the agent is curating its own environment, right? This way the agent then can reflect on the a, the agents can then reflect on the environment they maintain in the execution of the next application or process, and it's that's just perpetual, right? It's like a self winding clock. It just keeps on adding to the indexes and logs, and it's doing this in a very lightweight fashion. So, you know, think of what Splunk has done for just, and it really has just done, you know, indexing for, you know, activity logs, and we're saying we're doing that universally at the application layer, right? We've, we've done this for all of your records, your, all of your APIs, all of your services. Uh, not only are we keeping all of those logs and indexing everything, not only making it all available to analytics, we're making it available to an execution environment, and in fact, it's one environment uh, for analytics and uh, uh, applications. Wow. Okay, I, I better pass you back to Eric, who can throw the audience. Uh, you know, I'm sure they've got a lot of questions. Yes, we have some really good ones. Very, very interesting stuff too. So let me just start throwing some of these at you, Dave. Okay, so one of the Attendee says, and if, if you want, I can make you the presenter again, and you can go back to your screen share if you want to show stuff. But one of the attendees writes, okay, we can see objects dynamically presented and computed, but what about actions? Can you show some kind of uh, action? What would what would that look like? Well, I mean, this. The, I mean, you want to? I'd actually have to slow it down, right? It'd be like stopgap photography. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, we're actually doing the action. So, in our system. So uh, let me back that up. So you're talking about essentially think of, think of a file system, right? The world's most pervasive information storage is a file system. The most stable uh, component of the entire enterprise is a file system. Now, by itself, it does nothing, right? You know, it serves files. It's like a web server of sorts, right? So imagine you had, and you know, imagine if you had a web style key value. Um, where the key was the link and the value was the resource, right, of everything. And it was just one long skinny table. And you had these software agents, which themselves were resources. Our system control, controller calls these stateless resources, and uh, it um, interprets against, you know, it's just grabbing a resource. It's looking at that resource, any rules against that resource, evaluating that model against its own, you know, linked or metadata-related rules to then, um, you know, find out what else it should do. So it essentially evaluates the request. It makes a selection of what it's, uh, you know, what the optimal response is based on the rules. And then it actually performs and delivers that payload. And it does that all in a millisecond. So the only analog, and I understand why Robin is, you know, struggling to tag us because, you know, we're like a cross, you know, cross hit, you know, we're country and rock and roll, right? Uh, cross category hit, um, you know, we're database and application layer. Um, is the only other way you would do something like this is, you know, you'd have an agent, you'd have a, you'd code CE complex event agents, right? And you would actually code them as listeners. Then you would tie the, you would link those to a business rule, man, a business rule management system, a BRMS, which might then be connected to a BPMN system, a business process management system, which might then be connected to uh, BEPL, BPEL. Uh, system for ex its execution, which will inevitably be tied to multiple data stores. And what you're talking about is a really complex environment where you actually have, you know, uh, transactional semantics trapped all over the place. You have uh, state trapped all over the place. You have latency all over the place. And what we're saying is, well, we'll why don't we just make one really capable, essentially generic agent wearing, working over a generic uh, data store uh, to deliver uh, customized you know, payloads in context at runtime. So, you know, um, you know, if you look at the, you know, uh, the, you know, the kind of people that are, have been associating themselves uh, with us, the kind, uh, kind of announcements we've been making on our website, you'll see we're attracting some pretty prominent folks and uh, yeah. getting a lot of prominent attention. Sure. So we got a couple other really good questions let me throw at you, and I have a couple of my own. Um, so one of the attendees asks, 
what if there are a thousand employees actively changing the system? Is there a point in time when the system state is correct, and does the system does the system have state at all? Well, in, in the system effectively it's a file system. It's stateless, right? So uh, because we're, remember we're working with the principle of immutability. And look, I, I realize some of these concepts might not you know jive with everybody. Um, you know, we we all use Google uh, you know uh, for search, right? And how many people understand how the Google and uh, you know algorithm actually works? Uh, so you don't have to know how the Google algorithm works to use it, right? Well, I assure everybody on the line that we're working with, uh, you know, uh, you know, enterprise Java and .NET programmers to deliver these things. But it, uh, and you know, um, and regular business analysts, regular folks, and doing really interesting things. So uh, it's a stateless environment, right? It's just all stuff, right? And every time, every time you make a request of the system, right? You're making an HTTP request. You're calling our system controller. And the system controller is calling our agent. Our agent is just another resource, and they're distributable, right? So a thousand people call the system, they get a thousand distributed agents, right? And the agents can also are, can distribute themselves, so they can actually, you know, they can actually, you know, partition themselves for a complex chunk of work, right? So we can do things like MapReduce. We can actually, you know, partition that very quickly. We can even do more complex things. So you know, with, with anything new, it's it's sort of like magic to people. But what we've really done is, if anything, we've stripped away the cruft of the modern enterprise. We can work, and we're clearly working with it, right? We work with all the existing systems. So it's so it's just, the system is stateless. Anytime you click in the system, depending on the rule, you know, you've requested something. You've requested a, a model, right? A model for that interaction. That model is delivered to you. The agent then interprets it uh, for you. The agent essentially uh, uh, doing an added value service on your behalf. It's going to find all the rules that apply for you and, uh, and customize that service interface on the fly. Um, and it's doing that all in a, uh, its own little interaction cache. And then when it's going to persist back to the, at the end, when it concludes and delivers the payload, it pers and this is all millisecond speed, right? You know, uh, you know, we're running right up there with SAP HANA, um, and yet we're persisting to databases, and they're running in memory. And that, that's a pretty big distinction, right? And so then what happens is we're not actually ever overwriting data, right? So our writes are really fast. We're creating new res resources to represent the diff. So I use that term event sourcing, and of course, you know, we're even taking that to a new uh, uh, level inside our system. So we're creating new resources, and so that uh, depending on the next person who clicks in, they'll get the, the they will uh, grab the latest resource. Uh, if you want, if you want to manage things like contention, of course, we, you know, we, we when we're in the acid-based world, you know, we have to uh, we want uh, to have consistency, and we also want to have uh, dependability, and we want to have uh, you know rollback, right? We want to be able to roll things back if they're wrong. So the system actually uh, provides all of those. If you're in something, let's say that let's say your archetypical situation for consistency, which is a reservation of some form, right? There is a constrained resource. There's only a hundred seats to this uh, Tom Petty concert, and if you want a hundred, one of these hundred seats to the Tom Petty concert, uh, then you know they're going to be people are consuming them all the time. They might be unavailable on a website, uh, and that website is offering them. You might be an interaction, but other people are consuming inventory of those tickets at the same time. This is an age-old problem, right? I mean, this is. And a lot of people are dealing, like people like eBay and other organizations and Amazon are, are dealing these things with uh, sort of base uh, eventual consistency. Um, what we do is we make every interaction, every single interaction in the system is acid, right? But we do process as a series of acid transactions, right? So in our world, a process is an asynchronous set of acid transactions. And we can actually, for a process, especially a human process, um, those things sometimes are in inherently base. And so you can loosen the acid uh, properties for that particular problem space if you wanted to. And I don't think we're uh, unique in having done that. I think other people, you know, I think our system is very unique. But as far as managing that differential between uh, base and acid, right, because, because remember, we're not just an unstructured NoSQL database, um, which are largely just base. We're doing actually transactions out of our system. So we are acid and base, and we're letting you model the business <laughs> user in a way that addresses both. That's pretty funny. I've got a couple more really good questions I want to get to, so let me just dive in 
one of the attendees writes, I understand the generic data store concept, but how does the app differentiate between where to pull data from in terms of relational data, or as in your example, the graph data? So, that's a, so that, that, these are great questions. So we, I know you guys attract a, a smart audience, so, you know, uh, um, uh, which is uh, always a pleasure. So, you know, so we're talking about an undirected graph and how do you find things. So that actually puts us in the domain of sparse matrix processing, right? So now very few people in the world are going to be specialists in sparse matrix processing, but yet it exists. It's in a domain of computer science. And what it means is, like, how do you find signal in noise, right? How do you find the right resources? Uh, as I've explained throughout, we're doing this as a combination of links and metadata, right? Links being explicit relations and metadata being non-explicit relations. And, you know, essentially what the agents are doing in a functional kind of way are building a complex, uh, a complex expression um, in a pipe and filter kind of way on the fly. So this is all, you know, proven science. And... Uh, but it's you know so this that, that's actually exactly how it does it right so the the system is binding the domain ontologies at runtime right so you're separate go back to that slide right we're separating the physical layer from the logical layer the logical and the domain layer which means we can have infinite number of applications and processes running against one single store that's what gives us cross process cross application analytics it was, it's what gives us smart applications. It gives, it's what gives us inter-process interoperability, um, value chains, value networks. So uh, having that generic store is very important. And then what, what's happening is the agent is then saying, okay, for you, for Eric Cavanaugh, who's trying to run this application because this is who Eric Cavanaugh is, this is the group he belongs to, these are his affiliations, these are the rules that apply to him, it's, you know, in, in – in computer science, you'd call that building a small world network, right? Instead of trimming a graph, which is a very expensive behavior, we actually build up a network, right, from what we know. What do we know? We know Eric, we know Eric Cavanaugh made a request. What else do we know? We know what Eric Cavanaugh requested, right? He clicked on a link. Well, we know what that link relates to. We know everything about Eric Cavanaugh and every single relationship that Eric Cavanaugh has to other people and other records inside the system. We know... The what Kavanaugh requested, and we know every past performance of that, right? So if you're calling a service that might even be a third-party service, we know every past performance of that service as well. Uh, and we can bring all of that information to the fore uh, to uh, give you a personalized response. So it's really you know, I mean, what so, you're trying to what, what you've created here is a new kind of application design and execution platform. I mean, that, I think that's probably one of the most interesting and daunting aspects of what you have here because it is representative of a much more dynamic and loosely coupled way to create applications and really not even applications so much as desired functionality, right, and then deliver that functionality and monitor it over time. I guess one question I would have would be, um, let's say let's say you are maybe a, a hospital and you put this in place to to enable sharing of information, sharing of, uh, of, of patient information, for example, how, how would you implement business rules to protect things like, like patient privacy and so forth? Can all of that be dynamically managed as well? Yeah, and, and is, and we're working in those exact same situations. And, and, and look, we're not creating the complexity in the domain. Remember, the problems exist. Robin pointed that out. Uh, the dim so we have these problems in the modern enterprise, and everybody knows it. And, you know, if we think in the conventional uh, approach, we'd say, well, for every problem of uh, indirection and middleware we have in our current enterprise architecture, let's add another piece of middleware. Well, that's a vendor's dream, but it's an enterprise nightmare. So we're just compounding our problems all the time. We actually had to step back, and we were just, let's say, naive enough to realize, uh, think that there was a solution to this by stripping out the cruft of the, the modern enterprise, and that's really what we have. Uh, so we work. We don't have the blessing to work in any green fields. We're working with people's LDAP, Kerberos, SAML, uh, financials, payroll. We work with all of their different middleware uh, to the extent necessary. We work with their service libraries and everything else like that. Uh, but what we're doing here is we're giving the opportunity to uh, create uh, rules, declarative rules that connect those nodes that you were talking about, like patient 
patient uh, protection, right? Well, there's a patient. They're, they are a node in our system. Uh, there are applications that want to call that node. They have more or less permissions against that. There are people using those applications. Uh, the application is a node. Those other people are nodes. And, there are, and those people are also related to other groups. So what we're doing is actually just creating a very flexible structure that actually reflects the real world, the way things really are, because the things really aren't trapped in middleware boxes. That's a middleware vendor's dream. Uh, uh, things are really actually just loosely coupled resources, right? And we're just restoring that. When you have a pile of loosely coupled resources, you need to work on them in context. And that's what we're making possible. So, uh, yes, we're working in spaces like HIPAA. We're talking to people in, uh, in the financial space that have to deal with uh, things like uh, SOX and all that other kind of stuff that are causing them huge problems. Because everybody knows, it's just a joke, but everybody knows that if we did an audit of most of these huge organizations, they would fall flat on their face because their enterprises generally are not protecting them in the way that they need to be protected. Yeah, sure. Um, and I think what we need to do, I think the times call for a rethinking of enterprise uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. No, I think so, too. Let me get two more specific questions, then we'll wrap up. We're going a bit long. We still have people on the line. Yeah, we do. It's Well, we always get a good, uh, a good Q&A here. So here's one comment from uh, an attendee. Maybe you could just speak to it very quickly. It's one of the attendees, right? So it's, it not only does not manage metadata in the traditional sense, it actually increases the amount of metadata by dynamic, unsupervised curating. Is that right? 100% absolutely correct. And that's a very powerful idea, and the, the person who asked that question probably understands that. Um, so, you know, so, uh, you know, think of this, that, you know, you know, normally when you go in design time and uh, you actually code the context of the designer, at that design time, right? They get whatever requirements they get, as imperfect as they are at that time, right? We, we know requirements are incomplete, incorrect, right? And, um, and sometimes incoherent. And then somebody codes them, even in good faith. But remember, it's their interpretation of those requirements that are being coded. It's their context at the time they code it. They push it out into the universe. And what happened to the business context of the user at that moment? Mm -hmm. you've, you've just precluded it. And what we're saying is that's absolutely ridiculous. We need to embrace that context. Now, we can selectively use it, turn it up or turn it down. You know, uh, you know when, I, when I work out, I'm, uh, you know, I have an elliptical machine that I don't use enough. Uh, and when I do it, I like to put on my, uh, plug in my iPod into a, a little system I got there. And depending on whether, where the family is in the rest of the house, I turn it up or down, right? Right? You know, and I may, you know, because I like my music loud. But you know, obviously, if the family's around me, I'm not going to do that to them. So, likewise, all we do is present controls, and we present the controls in a way that's completely auditable, completely traceable. In fact, I demonstrated some of that, and and you know, it's more auditable and traceable than what we have in the current convention. So, while I appreciate that some folks. Uh, We'll find a lot of this new, and I, I do appreciate that they're hanging on to this call. I mean, it looks like we still have 40 people hanging on the line, which is just fantastic. Um, so I appreciate that these are new, but they actually have to look at, well, what are the pros and cons of the current environment? What kind of controls do they really have now? And how many of those controls are really sort of phantom controls, that they're maybe only controls if you sort of squint your eyes, but, you know, and we sort of wink, wink, nudge, nudge. But in the real world, we know when we talk to business people that they're not happy with their current systems. They're not happy with the rate of change. They're not happy with uh, the lack of personalization. They're not happy. You know, why shouldn't enterprise apps be like Foursquare, where uh, when I'm moving through the universe and if I like pizza, it should be recommending me pizza? Right. That's easy to do with the GPS. I mean, that's a relatively simple idea and, and very well executed by Foursquare, nothing against them. It's much harder in the enterprise, and what we're doing is saying we're, we're bringing that to the enterprise, right? We're, we're taking those enterprise class uh, requirements and constraints and applying it to a loosely coupled, uh, late-bound, uh, networked universe. Um, and, you know, it takes, you know, I was talking to a famous enterprise architect the other day, and they were agog. I mean, I, I mean they were looking at it, and they were like, you've essentially created a system for managing capability management where because in, 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 in the current uh, enterprise architecture they talk about capabilities as distinct from services because they know services aren't very adaptable but capabilities are a concept of adaptability that uh, that EAs like to talk about 
from a conceptual perspective, and we're making that real, right? We're actually saying, hey, you can have your service library right here, and we can bind those services to rules and other data in, uh, in real time. And we yeah, can also true. create – we could create new APIs and serve it back to your enterprise as well. So, yeah. like, one organization we're working with, I mean, a lot of the organizations we work with don't have any good systems of record, right? And even though they're huge, multi-billion dollar organizations, they don't have one single representation of a person. So that we actually have to create a composite representation of people, and we're doing that so fast and so much better than that they've been doing it internally, they're now pushing out our composite views of people back to their legacy apps. So it's just, you know, it's an enabling technology. It's going to change things. Well, I'll tell you what, folks. I'm going to throw one last um, question over <laughs> to you, and then we'll give you a copy of all the questions, too. And I'll kind of expand on this. But one of the attendees asks, how does the notion of, of a user sandbox fit in with a global environment? In other words, test and develop environments, et cetera. Does this translate into subset data environments? I'm guessing the answer is that, that it certainly could. And how does this sync up eventually into a gold Copy. I think what, I think the question there, just to to perhaps paraphrase it a bit, is you were showing us a lot of sort of data and situational awareness discovery type stuff, and then you're actually going in and hard coding, if you will, rules or or allowing changes to existing rules and structures and so forth. And I guess one question I would have would be, how can you, in a strategic fashion, navigate through significant changes over a period of time as, let's say, the, the chief executive officer for this hospital, for example, who wants to take a step back and, and look at anything significant that's changed. How do, how do significant changes bubble up to the top, I suppose, is, is one question. And then how do, you, um, how do you manage to preserve certain structures and then allow certain other structures to be changed? Right. I'm going to try and answer every part of that multi-part question. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is for those uh, who want to ask me a question after Dave at Enterprise Web, uh, and you can even get my email right off uh, the website. So um, we, we enjoy this space and we enjoy leading with ideas, and we're happy to answer those questions. Second is um, uh, nothing's hard-coded in our system. So our system is a system of dynamically composed nodes. So what you saw me do there was you show, uh, I, sh I actually showed something pretty complex. We could do very, you know, uh, you know, Boolean rules in the system, but everything's being done declaratively. Um, so there, uh, and when we say declaratively, we mean for those RCS people on the line, we mean declarative programming, not just a, what a lot of people say is a declarative UI, which just means a, a hard-coded 4GL or something like that, uh, which Robin alluded to. So uh, this is true declarative programming in the declarative programming sense, which it really means something. Then, um, then as far as the history of change, well, actually, if you remember, in a way, everything's an application of the system. And if you remember when I was in a record at one point, I popped up a history of all the changes to that record. Well, I could do that at any level of the system to any level of detail. We can model, we can walk the history of changes. We could actually analyze the changes at runtime, right? And remember, there might be some things that are, you know, it's not like... You know, I'm against gratuitous proceduralism, right? Because if the world is completely procedural, then you've limited people's options. You've created this whole, uh, you know, uh, domino chain of things will break, right? Because the world is adapting all the time. If you don't adapt to your environment, you die, right? So, uh, so what you need to do is you need to be able to support change. But obviously, in an enterprise, we we support change, and it, it, even supporting change is relative. So there's these notions. I don't know, Eric, if you've heard of them. You're a smart guy, so you probably have is uh, pace layering or shearing layers, which is a notion that change happens faster on the periphery than it happens at the center, and that you actually increase your constraints on change as you approach the center. Now, I think that's just true, right? If I'm a business, if I'm a, uh, if I'm a, if I'm a customer service rep or a salesman or anybody on the frontier creating value or uh, an implementer, creating value with customers at the point of contact, yeah, I need more flexibility, and as long as I'm not changing the financial system, why do you care? Let me solve problems. Let me deliver business value. Judge me on the business value I deliver, and we can make that all introspectable, right? That's called goal orientation. As we get closer to the center, we need to put more controls on things, right? So, you know, you don't want your HR system to be controlling, uh, changing willy-nilly. You don't want your financial system to be changing all the time either. But let's, look, let's analyze that for a second. You know what? They change too. 
And let's look how hard it is to change an organizational structure at a modern enterprise. Near impossible. They spend millions, millions and millions of dollars and years to do simple things when they do a merger or something like that. And we're saying, hey, when you and, and look, we didn't invent the merger, right? The, the merger wasn't our requirement. It was a real-world domain requirement. We just facilitated the latent capacity to make that change by the people authorized to make that change, and we do it in a way that's completely auditable um, with the history of every single person who touched the, even, even the nodes in an organizational charge. I need, you know, because, hey, let's talk about, this happens all the time. A division has to move under, a department has to move under a new division. Well, in our system, you just sort of drag and drop it, right? All the history of that node is still preserved. We know where it was associated. We know where it is now associated. We could get whatever, we could require whatever approvals for that change we need to make that change happen, uh, including time date stamping it so it takes effect on a certain date, et cetera. Uh, but we're enabling that to happen. And, you know, it, it's something that could take years and cost millions now could be done in like 15 minutes while the guy's drinking coffee. I mean, so we're fundamentally changing the economics of smart applications and adaptable architecture. Yeah. I mean, we're changing the economics of uh, intelligent architecture, much like MapReduce and Hadoop changed the economics of uh, big data analytics. Yeah. And this is, uh, you know, we're, go we're heading towards the cloud and everybody's screaming now, you know, the latest marketing stuff, cloud, 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 horizontal interoperability. Guess what? <laughs> the, cl the cloud will only be as horizontally scalable as the applications that run upon those CPUs. So there's been great innovation in the data management side. There's been great innovation on in the uh, cloud-based infrastructure side. But don't be fooled. If your apps aren't horizontally scalable, you will sub-optimize your CPUs. Yeah. And that's what people are finding out. They're finding out, oh, gosh, running on Amazon is pretty expensive. Oh, running on the, these places are pretty expensive. Because they're not achieving, that's not necessarily Amazon or Rackspace's problem. It's the app layer, right? And, you know, the app layer is still the same app. You know, we have all this innovation in devices, data management, everywhere else. Where is the innovation at the app layer? It's yeah. nowhere. Yeah. Well, folks, we went through uh, more questions than usual, but we have some great ones, and this is just fascinating stuff. And Dave is just a walking quote machine. I already pulled out like 15 hilarious quotes here, but it's all good stuff, and it, it really is reflective of how um, significantly different the world is today in terms of what you can do than it was just two or three years ago. So, wow, big thanks to our friend Dave Dougal from Enterprise Web. We'll have this archive up on the website at Inside Analysis very soon. And, folks, there's going to be a whole remake to InsideAnalysis.com, so watch closely in the next week or so. We're going to flip the switch and knock on wood, hope everything works as it should, and you'll have a whole new look at InsideAnalysis.com. With that, folks, I'm going to bid you all farewell. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We will get all these questions off to our presenters today. And with that, we'll say take care, folks. We'll catch up to you next time. Watch us, come back next week on Tuesday. We'll have Burst talking about Amazon Redshift. So talk about big changes. That is a big one as well. So take care, folks. Bye-bye. Thanks, Eric.